So this is the title of my, my talk this evening. It's also the title of a book that was published in 2008, which means it was finished in 2007, while by most accounts at the time, the economies of the, of the world were growing quite steadily and quite nicely. That's not entirely true. If you were watching what was happening financially, it was a very different story. But most commentators concentrated on, on the traditional measure of economic output, GDP, and how it was, uh, was doing. Um, when the book was published, it was just at the time that the, the global recession hit. And uh, a book that was written really, f if anything, for a very academic audience, uh, began to attract attention because it was a surprise to, to some at any rate that there was an economist out there saying that maybe growth is not it's cracked up to be and, and we could manage without it because it looked like we were going to have to. Anyway, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is in most of it is, is a summary of that work, somewhat updated. Uh, and then at, at the very end, I'll, I'll just say a, a few words about what I'm doing currently to go beyond the, the work that, that I'll be describing to you. So my, my talk is very much what I call big picture. There are many issues that spin off from what I'll be saying, uh, and I hope many questions that, uh, that it stimulates in your mind, but questions that, well, what does this mean at the, the factory floor level? What does it mean at the municipal level? And so on. Those are all very, very important questions. But most of what I'll be saying will be talking at the, at the national macro level, and we can discuss things at the other levels uh, later on. So let me start with this. This is a report. It comes out every year from the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, its title <laughs> tells you everything about the report, Going for Growth. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of a compendium of advice, of advice for all of the OECD countries as to how they can uh, make their economies grow faster. And this, I think, captures uh, a very a uh, key or fundamental idea uh, about, mo about how most people think about our economies. They must grow. We have to have growth. Growth is good. There may be some um, sort of side issues that we have to take care of, but basically growth is, is the answer to pretty well any other problem that we face. So I want to now sort of go back a little bit into history and see, well, where did this idea come from? Um, particularly the idea that governments should take responsibility for seeing that growth takes place in our economy. That, in fact, turns out to be not a very old idea. So let me go back to the 30s, the Great Depression, where um, the situation was, was economically and socially terrible. I mean, can you imagine how these men thought or reacted when they saw this sign from the Chamber of Commerce? You know, just keep moving on. There's, there's no work for you here. Um, during that period, though, along comes uh, John Maynard Keynes with um, what for then was really a very unusual explanation of why uh, these um, uh, modern economies were in deep depression and didn't seem to be able to get out of it. Uh, in the simplest terms, he explained that employment derives from expenditure. And if the economy left to its own devices just isn't spending enough money, then people will not be employed. His solution was for the government to step in and spend money. Spend money, if you like, it didn't have um, to help stimulate the economy. Two things happened um, in real life after his book was published. One was the housing boom, which um, was a, an increase in expenditure and people could see the economies picking up. And then, of course, World War II, where expenditures really ran rampant and full employment was maintained or achieved. Now, these dates here represent the years in which these countries' governments passed legislation committing their governments to full employment. They now thought, because of Keynes, they had the tools at their disposal to, to solve the unemployment problem. But they weren't talking about growth at this point. They were talking about full employment. Within a few years, I would say by about um, 1950, there were a number of economists out there saying that if the government stimulates expenditure to secure full employment, some of that expenditure will go on new factories, new machines, new infrastructure. It will expand the capacity of the economy to produce. And therefore, if the now expanded economy was going to provide full employment, expenditure had to increase even more. This is economic growth. It wasn't, it wasn't until the early 1950s, however, that governments decided that they would promote growth first and em full employment second. It started out saying, well, we'll promote growth in order to get full employment, and then it switched around. That has something to do um, with, with the Cold War, of course, and so on. 
But so by 1960, which is when this photo was taken, this is the founding meeting of the OECD, the people who put out that report I showed you at the beginning, they adopted the pursuit of growth actively by government as formal policy. So, so in other words, the commitment of governments to the pursuit of economic growth as now I would say the primary economic policy uh, dates back to about 1960. It wasn't long before um, a number of people started leveling criticism at this. I just put up here the covers of some books that certainly influenced me, but and some of them I, I expect have been read by people in this audience. Galbraith actually wrote his book a little bit before uh, uh, the 1960s, but it was a very well-read book during the 60s, and you had Mishan, The Costs of Economic Growth, uh, a, a fascinating book by Georgescu Rogan saying that the, the second law of thermodynamics had implications for growth, of course, the limits to growth, and so on, a whole slew of books. Whilst of, I think they had some impact on how people began to think about growth, um, uh, it didn't really change the commitment uh, of governments and, 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 and many people to the pursuit of growth. Um, the next historical event that I think is really important were the uh, uh, energy crises uh, of the 1970s, 1980s, when we had uh, incidents like this. People just could not fill their cars with gas. Now, to a fair degree, this was a, a politically driven shortage, but it did make uh, people think, you know, is there also an underlying scarcity of oil that if we're not confronting now, we're going to have to confront at some point in the future. So again, growth was being queried. It certainly wasn't being challenged in a major way. But when we got back into the later 80s and 90s, um, growth still remained really prominent as it does today. And I've put this up here because this is a, a, a picture of a factory being opened and what I, I like about this is the topsy-turvy world it now signifies because more and more factory openings were no longer being celebrated because the factories were going to make things that people obviously needed. They were being celebrated because of the jobs they created. And so here's some typical headlines. New vehicles may create hundreds of new jobs. That's, it used to be that you employ people to create vehicles. Now it's the vehicles that are creating jobs. The Scotsman is a steel plant that creates jobs. Another car factory that creates jobs. Here's an energy plant, creates jobs. I mean, I presume it creates energy as well. Um, so you can see how peculiar this is now becoming. We've got ourselves into a position where we, we, have, we feel we have to produce things in order to employ people. And of course, that's got everything to do with the kind of distributional system we have in our economies. You don't have a job, you don't get paid, you don't get much of a share of the output. Um, I just picked up one more recent, uh, a very recent and very topical example of the claim that something someone wants to do is all about jobs. Here we are, we need a future casino now in Toronto <laughs> for jobs. Okay, now we're heading into the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, I won't say anything specifically about this because we've all lived through it, but I'm going to show you a chart uh, that I didn't produce which sort of summarizes all the different uh, ideas people have come up with for explaining how we got into this mess. Monetary policy was too easy. Underestimated risks in financial markets. The housing bubble. Foreign debt. I mean, it, it's it's almost all there. But when I looked at this, and I kind of liked the person's effort to, to put it all together in one, in one picture, uh, one thing struck me as, as missing, and that is greed. <laughs> and I think greed had a lot to do with the recession, and it has a lot to do with some of the fundamental problems we face in our economy. And it's not just greed, of course, it's also this extreme um, inequality that we are now, we're now facing. In fact, even our Conference Board of Canada has, has got interested in this, and they report that 71% of the world's population live in countries where they are experiencing increased inequality. So this is a, a very serious problem. Interestingly enough, a lot of the Latin American countries are not in that group anymore. Just put that idea out there. But you can see where most of the people live, ourselves, of course, that's what, that's what we're now experiencing. But rising inequality is not just a matter of what's happening at any point in time. There's an intergenerational aspect of this rising inequality. And so here we have 
students, and what better place to be talking about this, uh, graduating from our universities with uh, ever-increasing loans. And we've got, I have to say it, my generation saying, you know, get, get to work. You, you've, got to, you've got to keep me, uh, you've got to pay for my social, uh, what is it, security and Medicare. <clears throat> and let's be clear on this. It doesn't matter how much you've saved in the past. It's always the working population of the day that supports you. Your savings give you a claim over the output of the working population, but it's them who have to be at work to provide whatever the retired people wish to consume. So that's kind of uh, a, a take on, from a sort of a, <clears throat> what I might call a more conventional economic approach to, to where we are. The problem, from my point of view as an ecological economist, is that whilst we've been having all these troubles with the economy, we've also been having an increasing impact on the biosphere. And this further complicates the, 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 the problems that we face and the difficulty of finding a comprehensive solution to them all simultaneously. So what I want to do now is just give you a little bit of data to, uh, which I think brings home the message of how, to what extent we have increased our uh, reliance on the biosphere for the resources that have supported all this economic growth. So this is a graph that goes from 1900 to 2005 and it's in billion tons and it's a, the sum total of materials extracted from the planet to support all the economies uh, of the world. So in the first half of the 20th century, I'm going to stop it there, you can see there was a gentle, steady increase <coughs> in material extraction. The blue component of fossil fuels, we often talk about energy and, and, and materials and that's okay, most of the energy, commercial energy we bring into the, our economy comes in first as material, comes in as fossil fuels, which is why it is on this graph. So over that 50-year period, the annual use of materials doubled. Then look at what happened in the second half of the 20th century. 700%. One of the things we know pretty clearly is that, because we don't get it from economics, we get it from the physicists, is that the material we bring in doesn't get destroyed. It gets degraded, but then it gets disposed of back into the environment. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised that now we're getting uh, articles in prestigious places like Nature, which are talking about planetary boundaries and the, the fact that we are now exceeding what uh, these authors say is the safe operating space for humanity, symbolized by the green circle. You can see the issues identified there. I won't read them all, but climate change, ocean acidification. Down here, it's the nitrogen cycle. Over there in red, the biodiversity loss. And by their calculation, they say, look, with respect to those three right now, we're already beyond the safe operating capacity of the planet. In other words, the extent to which the planet can support us on an ongoing basis. So, not good news, but my whole talk isn't all bad news, but some of it is, 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 pretty, is pretty dismal, I have to say. Um, let me just say one more thing. Uh, I want to talk a bit more about energy. Um, one of the authors that I like uh, is, is Charles Hall, David Murphy and Charles Hall. Uh, this is a paper where they look at three eras of economic growth going back to 1930 and relate these eras to the access and use of cheap fossil fuels. So they take the first uh, what they call their pre-peak era, going all the way back from 1861. You see this literally exponential increase in the use of oil. And then from 1970 to the late, uh, well, you can see about 2008, it bumped along, uh, but still increased. And now we have um, considerable debate about whether we've entered the era of peak oil or whether it, we will be uh, there fairly soon. So there's some debate about the range of, 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 of peak oil. And then we're looking at some kind of decline. Now, I don't know if that's true. And of course, there's, there is some talk about uh, new supplies of oil. I've been reading up on that. It's uh, very unclear just how much new oil will be found by these methods. Uh, I still find this... Um, uh, view of the future still essentially uh, convincing. Uh, but I want to just take this one step further. And I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a concept called the energy return on investment. What this does is to say, for any energy that we obtain, we have to put some energy in in order to get it. And that different energy technologies offer a different energy return on energy invested. And if we have an energy return on energy invested of 50, then 98% of the energy 
that we get out is net energy because you only need 2% to generate the energy. That's the 50 to 1 ratio. But as you move down towards here, then the proportion of the energy that you get out uh, declines in relation to, um, that, that, that you can use, declines in relation to what you get out. So this is the net energy cliff. Um, the earlier oil and gas fields had an energy return on energy invested up in the, the high end of this, 40 to 50. Um, and interestingly enough, as long as the energy return on investment is 10% or more, then at least 90% of the energy we get out, we can use. We've only used up to 10% of it. But once you get past this, a very interesting thing happens. You get this dramatic drop in the available energy uh, from these alternative energy technologies because of the amount of energy they require in order to give us the energy that, that we need. So there's a really key question here, I think, and that is, even if we want to continue growth, are we going to be able to sustain the kind of economic growth we've become accustomed to on the basis of energy forms that are at this end of the spectrum? One of the authors who's looked into this the, in the most detail is Robert Ayers in this very good book, which I recommend, The Economic Growth Engine. And um, he's certainly not anti-growth, but he's, uh, he's a, a very um, insightful uh, engineering economist. And in this book, one of the things he says is this. Although highly uncertain, the most probable forecast for US GDP is one in which growth ceases sometime between 2030 and 2040. So he's saying even if the US wants to grow, he doesn't think it's particularly probable. Well, it's already slowing down. Well, of course it's slowing down. And I've got some a very nice interjection. If we look at what's happened in Canada, this is a graph which showed from 1960 to 2020. Well, actually, the data only goes up to 2010, but I project to 2020. It shows the rate of economic growth in Canada. That is percentage change in real gross domestic product. product. And it's, of course, it moves around a lot, but you can see the trend line. <coughs> so we're ex we've experienced a decline in the average rate of economic growth. And if you just run that forward, by 2040, growth um, is zero. That's total economic growth. If you do it on a per capita basis, of course, because the population's been growing, it's got a, a steeper slope, and it hits the axis at 2010. <laughs> it's not just energy that we have to think about. It's also... Um, materials. And the EU is taking a hard look at this because the EU uh, has within its territory very few of the raw materials that in particular our, our modern technologies seem to require. So this is the cover of a report uh, on a working, of a working group on defining critical raw materials. And it contains this map. What do we see in this map? The, the bulk of the 41 critical raw materials they identify in the report are in the global south. Um, nothing in the EU. They're not very happy about this. One of the things that though, caught my attention when I read the report was that they talk about, well, what are the risks to the EU? What are the risks to, the, to growth in the EU? And they have a, two categories of risk, one about socio-political factors, but the other is what they call environmental country risk. That's not a term that has a, an obvious meaning, but it has a very clear meaning when you read what they say. They say measures might be taken by countries with weak environmental performance to protect the environment and so endanger the supply of raw materials to the EU. This is a very peculiar way to look at environmental protection. But this, this comment, of course, is directed at the poorer countries, saying that they may take action to protect their environment and, and, and in so doing endanger the supply of raw materials to the EU and therefore growth in the EU. Okay, covering a lot of ground here, I'm going to now say something about technology. I, I won't say I love technology, that's too trite, but I obviously use it, um, maybe not as much as some. But this is one of my favourite places in London where I grew up. It's the entranceway to the Science Museum in London, and you can see all those beautiful old machines on, on display. So I don't want people to think I'm anti-technology, but I do think that um, uh, we've certainly got to look to other places for change other than technology to help us out of our problems. So let me tell you why. This is a, a picture of a computer in 1946. Um, that's actually a very significant year for me because that's when I was born. Um, but you can see the room's full of equipment, a lot of people, and it didn't actually do very much. By 1970, when I was finishing my dissertation at UBC, uh, well, the world's in colour, that's nice, fewer people, much more powerful equipment. <laughs> By 1995, now this is the year when students were born who are now entering our universities. 
a sobering thought. Um, that's what a, a typical computer looked like, and here we are in 2013. Uh, this is amazing progress, technological progress. There's no doubt about it. And let's look at the telephone, another example. There's a telephone in 1946, 1970. Now, I love this because you look at the bottom of that telephone. I'm sure some here in the room will remember this. There was a little tray where you... Yeah, yeah and you cook, you cook... Well, they forgot about it in 1970. <laughs> Technology can go backwards. What, what was in the tray? You kept your uh, phone numbers. Phone yeah. Contact list. Was it? Yeah, contact list. <laughs> Can't even remember the terminology. Here's a phone in 1995. We're cordless now. And, well, I mean, we call it a phone, but it does so many things. Okay, so again, a, an example of, of amazing progress in technology. But both of these examples, the computer and the phone, are examples of miniaturization. Now, there's a tendency to think that miniaturization means we're going to lessen the burden on the planet. Sounds like it. But miniaturization also has other implications. It allows us to do things like this. You couldn't design it. You couldn't build it, and you couldn't even operate this machine without miniaturization. Computers have made it possible for us to move masses of a material around. And here is the world's largest earth-moving machine. These are people down here. It's, I mean, it's, but I, I want to make the point again. It's miniaturization that makes this possible. Here's a, here's a c cityscape, and then they added this. Whee! Again, miniaturization made it possible, and miniaturization, in fact, let them down. They had to close it after the first couple of weeks because they had a software problem with their elevators. Um, Where is it? What is it? That's in Dubai, the tallest building in, in the world. The example I like best, though, is this one. Because this is a promotional picture uh, for the company that runs this, the world's largest cruise ship. And what I, I want to show you is what they think about their ship. This is the project engineer. I would say this is the most environmentally friendly cruise ship to date. It is much more efficient than other similar ships. See, what they're saying, and it's very commonly said, is if we can become more efficient, our problems will go away. But if we, if we increase scale more than we increase efficiency, the overall impact, in fact, increases. It doesn't get less. So we have to think of both dimensions of this. We've got to become more efficient, but we've also got to worry about scale. And scale, of course, is, is what growth is all about. You know the word effective goes with efficient. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So you're saying it needs to be more effective. Yes, but I, but I would also say efficient as well. In other words, we should be able to get the same service by using fewer materials and energy. That's what I mean by that. But if we're doing, getting more service, more, making our ships bigger, the overall impact will rise. Um, so these, this is a sort of an example of what's now called the rebound effect. So let me go into that just a little bit more. Imagine we make this automobile more efficient. It uses less energy. Now, it's quite easy then to calculate number of cars, reduction in energy, and think that's the energy saving you're going to get. But that's what happens if you don't take account of the human factors. A car that's more efficient has lower running costs. You have lower running costs, you tend to drive further. I mean, there is something to traditional economics. If things are cheaper, people tend to do more of it. If you drive further, you're going to use more energy, not necessarily overshadowing what you've saved, but at least reducing to some extent the savings. But that's only the direct rebound effect. It may take more energy to make this energy efficient car in the first place. That was something that was said about the Prius when it first came out. But that's still not the whole story. Let's suppose the owner of this car does in fact save money by, because they've got lower running costs. What do they do with the money? Well, they spend it. So this person happened to take a holiday in Spain. And it's only when you take account of the whole system-wide effects of the increase in efficiency that you can tell what the overall savings will be. Uh, I work very closely now with my colleague in Britain, Tim Jackson. And Tim talks about the dilemma of growth. He accepts pretty much the account I've given you now, that the growth we've had and the growth we're likely to have is putting an increasing burden on the biosphere. However, he also appreciates, as I expect you do too, that we have economies that are dependent on growth. And if the economy stops growing, very bad things can happen. So we have a dilemma. So imagine that we introduce an innovation that um, increases labor productivity. If you have inadequate economic growth, then you don't need such a large labor force to produce that output. So if you have inadequate economic growth, unemployment's going to go up. If unemployment goes up, consumption is going to go down. People don't have the incomes, they can't spend it. 
tax revenues will go down, deficits will go up. Right now, governments think in, in this context, they have to reduce expenditures, loan defaults can go up, investment goes down, we get lower economic growth. We get into this downward spiral, which is really frightening. If that's the only future we've got, that's a very bleak one. What I will be laying out for you in a little while is at least some alternatives that I think are feasible. Which leads me to this. The story about growth and why we need it and what it can do for us is a story. It's a, it's a widely told story, it's a widely reinforced story, but it's only a story. What we have to do, I believe, is tell different stories. And, and I regard the work I do on, on simulating alternative trajectories for economies as storytelling. Not prediction, not forecasting, but storytelling about what might be possible. Now, I'm not the only person who's in the storytelling business. You'll all remember the Brundtland Commission. They told us a story about sustainable development. But um, sustainable development, that concept has been so um, reinterpreted, to put it nicely, that even uh, Jim McNeil, who was the executive secretary for the Brundtland Commission, a very famous Canadian, said this about it in, uh, a couple of years ago, or five years ago now. Only in a Humpty Dumpty world of Orwellian doublespeak could the concept be read in the way some would suggest, distancing himself from the misuse and misinterpretation of that term. And just as an example of that, here's our own Department of Finance in Canada from their website, 2007, telling us what sustainable development is. Long-term sustainable, it's long-term sustainable economic growth. Well, that's not much of a change. Based on environmentally sound policies and practices. But why do they think we need those environmentally sound policies and practices? Because environmental degradation undermines prospects for continued economic development. It's still the traditional growth story. Now we have a more recent attempt to tell new stories. Green growth. This is the cover of a report that was written for the conference in Rio last year. And here's the first key message out of this report. A green economy grows faster than a brown economy over time while maintaining and restoring natural capital. Well, that's a nice idea. If the report had then told us how we could achieve that, it would have been a bit more persuasive. But the, the real key here is to say this. What is it they think is so important that they need why do they think it's so important they need to say that green, a green economy will actually grow faster? It's because they appreciate and appreciated that the likely audience for this report needed to hear the growth message. Because you only hear the growth message, you don't want to hear anything else. Uh, I, Jackson and I did a critique of this study and we weren't very kind to it. What it all comes down to then, in a way, is decoupling. At least the green growth story comes down to decoupling. Can we have an expanding economy, more goods and services, and at the same time use less energy and have lower environmental impact. That's, that's, that's in some ways the nub of the debate about green growth. So here's what green growth in theory looks like. GDP continues to rise, but we are able to get that increase with an absolute decline in the use of resources, and we're further able to decouple environmental impact from resources. So this is green growth, increasing output, reduced resources, reduced environmental impact. What I did was to sort of say, OK, well, let's see what's happened in the past to see whether we're if moving in any way towards this direction. So this is data for the whole world, and then I'll break it down into some subgroups. From 1971 to 2008, the source is the World Bank. Everything's indexed to 100. So I've got GDP, energy, and carbon dioxide. Well, so GDP, energy is my resource measure, carbon dioxide, environmental impact. You can see there was what you call relative decoupling. We, the energy and carbon dioxide went up more slowly than GDP, but we're not down here. We're increasing the impact. We're not reducing it. Now let's look at high-income countries. Same time period. Now, when you think that we signed on, we generally, the high-income countries, to the um, UN Convention on, on Climate Change in the, um, oh, 1994, you really can't see any impact of that. The only time huh, this stuff comes down is when the economy actually begins to tank. Uh, we look at Canada. Just, we're here. Might as well see how we're doing. <laughs> no surprise there, I'm afraid. Um, the... So I've looked at the high-income countries. Look at the low- and middle-income countries. I want you to see I've changed the scale. The other went to 300, now it goes to 600. 
So clearly, we haven't done any significant decoupling up to now, and yet despite the fact that countries of the world have been committing themselves to various degrees to try to do something about this problem, what, um, what Tim did was to say, okay, well, let's look to the future, Tim Jackson this is, and he said, where were we in 2007? And that, these measures on the left-hand side are grams of CO2 per dollar, and you can see what the world average was, what the UK uh, level was, and what the Japanese level was. I'm not sure that was the world average. That's so much. Yeah, that's the world number. All right, and then he, he does a number of scenarios. I'm just going to pick the one over here, where we would say, let's have 9 billion people by mid-century. Reasonable estimate. Let us suppose we had lots of economic growth, so that everybody in the poorer countries came up to the EU, EU level of 2007, and we add on to that 2% growth per year. How much would we have to decouple CO2 emissions to get down to 450 parts per million uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, which some people are now saying is too high anyway, but at least it's the IPCC's uh, recommended target. We'd have to have a 130-fold reduction in CO2 per dollar. So we have to go from 768 to 6 in 40 years. Doesn't look very likely. So, I'm not the only person questioning growth, questioning the question of scale. Uh, they've even taken to the streets in Europe. This was actually a, uh, a demonstration against economic growth. Um, further examples of people questioning growth. So here's some excerpts from newspapers. There's the, the Gazette talking about the sustainable economy, the Globe and Mail, can you do well without having more, Fear the specter of a no-growth world, the Wall Street Journal, new limits to growth, revive Malthusian fears. Here's Paul Crookman. The byline there, what is it? Running out of planet to exploit. <laughs> um, the new scientist, the folly of economic growth. The whole issue was devoted to this question. Here's the Guardian. The world is facing a natural resources crisis worse than the financial crunch. And on it goes. It's Christian Science Monitor, the, the Star. Here's Der Spiegel. Can the economist function without growth? Even the economist. Progress and its perils. I mean... That was a really startling uh, discovery for me to see that they were beginning to worry about this. Uh, many people writing books, I'll just mention one. Um, this is a report done by the <laughs> Sustainable Development Commission, a UK government commission, which produced a report called Prosperity Without Growth. The main author of this report was Tim Jackson, and some of you may have seen his book called Prosperity Without Growth. He dropped the question mark, by the way, when he produced it as a book under his own name. Um, what else have we got? The New Economics Foundation in Britain, growth isn't possible. It's on Facebook. This is the Center for the Advancement of a Steady State Economy. There are, this is what the second international conference on degrowth, more widely used in, uh, that term's more widely used in Europe, but we've had degrowth conferences in Canada too. Life beyond growth, the natural debt crisis, learning to live within our planet's means, that's from time. Degrowth in the Americas, that was last summer. A very recent book, Enough is Enough. Um, so, lots of people are questioning growth. So now I want to tell you about the sort of way I've approached this and some of my uh, earlier results and the, some of the later work. Any of you who've studied economics, maybe you teach economics, or have opened a textbook on economics, will have seen something like this very early on in the book. This is how economists explain an economy to new students. We say, look, the economy is made up of firms and households. The firms sell goods and services to the households. The households pay money to the firms. Where do the households get the money from? They provide the land, labor, and capital to the firms, and they receive payments. Um, and then we talk about this as a cycle, the circular, and, uh, and then we spend years sort of investigating this and understanding it better. I'm going to make it look a bit nicer, too, if I can. There we go. Um, but from an environmental point of view, it, this is no good because so much is missing. So what I've done here, I've added in the supply of resources needed to keep the economic cycle going. Those resources pass through the economy and are disposed of as wastes of various kinds. And now we've got problems of scarcity of resources and overloading the capacity of the biosphere to accept the wastes. When we do that, we get a feedback we start interfering with the biophysical cycles that affect the capacity of the biosphere to produce particularly renewable resources. And all that takes place on planet Earth. 
So what I want to say at this point is if you only remember one thing from this talk, please remember this, that the only reasonable way to think of an economy is as embedded in the biosphere. We can no longer assume that what we do as humans is small in relation to the biosphere. We are big movers of materials and energy. Uh, at the same time, as I've already said, and I think everyone here appreciates, we live in a very unequal world. So when I talk about managing without growth, my focus is on rich countries, at least rich countries going first. And in support of that view is all of the studies that are now coming out on economic growth and happiness. So here's a, quite a well-known uh, picture that, that you'll see in many places. It shows income per head and it shows uh, a happiness index which is based upon responses to questions about how people think about themselves and their lives. And you can see the scatter there, the different countries, and you can see this sort of shape. And what a number of people are saying is, look, it's pretty clear that when you get beyond a certain level of income per head, it doesn't show up uh, as, an as an improvement in people's sense of well-being. This is just one of many uh, um, examples of that. So what I set out to do was to build a model of the Canadian economy, which I called low grow, because I was interested in examining the possibilities of an economy which was either growing slowly or not growing at all. And I tried to answer the following question. Can we have full employment, no poverty, fiscal balance, that just means the government's paying its way, reduce greenhouse gas emissions without relying on economic growth? Because most people still say, no, you can't. You've got to have the growth to pay for these other things, to have full employment and so on. Uh, the answer, by the way, is yes, you can. Uh, but I'm going to give you a bit more detail than that. <laughs> so let's look at what makes an economy grow. Well, there are different ways of looking at this. And for this work, I did, took the following perspective. I said, well, we can look at it from the macro demand standpoint. That means let's look at what people spend money on. Because gross domestic product is the sum total of what we spend money on as final consumers. It doesn't include business purchases from other businesses. It includes what we buy in the stores, the services we buy, and so on. Consumption is part of GDP. Investment, when we spend money on new equipment and, and, uh, and buildings, that goes into our GDP. If the government buys new goods and services, that goes into GDP. And if we run a trade surplus, that's in our GDP. So, Low grow includes um, representations, if you like, of each of those variables. But we can also look at what are we capable of producing? How is the productive capacity of the economy changing over time? How is it likely to change? <clears throat> that depends upon our labor force, whether it's employed, its skills, on the capital stock that labor works with, and a whole host of other things that enter into productivity, how we're organized and so on. When I modeled these aspects and made a projection from 2005 to 2035 on the assumption to start with that the trends up to 2005 were to continue into the future, what would that future look like? Now oh, here's the answer. So we get that steady increase in GDP per capita. This model doesn't try to deal with the, the short-term ups and downs, it's a, an annual trend model. It shows greenhouse gas emissions, the green line rising, not as fast as GDP per capita, because we are getting some <coughs> efficiency gains. The blue line is unemployment, goes up a bit, comes down, doesn't do much there. The government, and this goes back to 2005, were running a heavy surpluses in this country. If you added up all governments together, and that would have continued uh, to go in that direction. But even with all this economic growth, this brown line, this is the human poverty index from the UN, it's rising. What that means is, even with all that growth, by 2035 there would be more poor Canadians at the end than at the beginning. Now, that's true, there'd be more Canadians, but to think that with an economy, look, it's gone above 200, more than twice the size, GDP per capita, and yet we would have more poor people. Not, not a happy business as usual scenario, but it can get a lot worse. I then said, what would happen if I squeezed out all of the growth from this economy? Starting in 2010, over the next 10 years, wind down increases in consumption, investment, government, all those things which contribute to economic growth. And you would expect it to be a disaster. And you won't be disappointed. When I ran the model doing that, uh, it was awful. Unemployment's just gone off the, off the graph. Poverty's gone way up. The government's running enormous uh, deficit, so its debt to GDP ratio is rising. We've stabilized. GDP per capita, got rid of growth, and 
greenhouse gas emissions come down. But this is the kind of scenario that people are very worried about. They say, well, we need growth to avoid this because this is awful. And so, can we do better? Um, as I've said, many people are asking that question. Here's Larry Elliott, the economics editor from The Guardian. He asked this. He said, the real issue is, is whether it's possible to challenge the growth at any cost model and come up with an alternative that is environmentally benign, economically robust, and politically feasible. Well, I focus mostly on the first two, because I think if you can't show this, you'll never get there, but just showing this doesn't automatically get you there either. So then I said, okay, can we generate a better scenario? So here's a better one. And again, what I did was introduce changes starting in 2010 to 2020. Now in this scenario, we've got no more economic growth after about 2030. Greenhouse gas emissions have come down significantly. Unemployment is lower than it's been for 50 years. The human poverty index would be the lowest in the world. And the government's debt to GDP ratio is still in looking very healthy. So how does that happen? I'm going to give you a list of things, and I can talk about them a little bit now and then perhaps in more detail if you have questions. Uh, some of these things are in the model, are simulated in the model, and others I think are important to complement what's in the model. The first is this. We have to rethink what we mean by success. Uh, and that's, I say that at the national level, I say it at the community level, at the institutional level, and at the personal level. Um, the idea that growth has to be way up there as a measure of success, I think, has to be shelved. One of the things that many observers have, have, have noted is that, is that we, more and more, try to demonstrate our, our status by what we consume. And, and so, since that's actually a zero-sum game, because if you buy something that raises your status, it, it's at the expense of someone else. That's the nature of status. It's a relative concept. And so, we're all trying to, well, generally speaking, trying to consume more to improve our status, and it just doesn't work that way. We have to find a way of having fewer status goods and buying fewer of them. I think this is important. We have to limit the extent to which we allow ourselves to access the biosphere for resources and as a waste depository, and the extent to which we use land for human purposes, because that's why you're seeing that loss of biodiversity. We're crowding out other species. I'm optimistic in the sense that I can point to quite a few examples where policy is moving in that direction, but it's not a self-conscious attempt to try to con con impose some discipline on ourselves. But I do think there are many examples where we are introducing these kinds of limits. I think that's a, a good move. In this scenario, I've made certain assumptions which lead to stable population. This is all Canadian, by the way, all of these scenarios. Stable population and labor force. So that's a, another uh, policy matter that needs some further discussion. The mechanism that brings the Greenhouse gas emissions down is a carbon price. At the moment, you can put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's free. We generally do things free a lot. So we use the atmosphere a lot for disposing of our greenhouse gases. Uh, BC now has a carbon, pr has, has a carbon tax. Um, many examples of attempts to put a, a price on, on carbon, and that's what's in the model, and it, I think, would, would, would do very nicely for us. But it's not just a question of discouraging the emissions of greenhouse gases from the obvious sources. I've got here the note that we'd have more informative prices. One of the problems I believe we have is that the prices we pay in the stores don't in any systematic way reflect the cost of the biosphere represented by the production and consumption and disposal of those products. The lack of a carbon price is one of the big omissions. If we had a carbon price imposed on, on fossil fuels, it would filter all the way through other prices. So commodities which require a lot of fossil fuels, either directly or indirectly in their manufacture or use, would also show an increase in their price. So we'd have better prices and we'd, we would respond to that. We do need a more efficient capital stock. We do now need our equipment to be better. And again, prices play a role there. Part of the design of, of, of equipment uh, it bears in mind what it's going to cost to make operate and run and so on. So better prices will also help us get a more efficient capital stock. Unemployment comes down in this scenario because I've modeled a shorter work week. I mean, if the economy is not growing, 
but we're still becoming more productive, nothing wrong with that, you don't need so many people at work. So how do you avoid that turning into mass unemployment? You reduce the average work year, average work week. So that is in here. And um, you know, there are countries in Europe which have uh, legislation which gives uh, employees a, the right to work less. But employers have to grant that right unless there are good reasons not to. So there are measures that can be taken to bring this about. And there's a bigger story to be told about that and frankly all of the other things too. I'm just giving you a quick overview as I go through this list. The Human Poverty Index comes down because I've included um, a number of anti-poverty programs. This Human Poverty Index has three components. An income component, an adult illiteracy component, and a life expectancy beyond 60 component. So I said, okay, well, let's attack each of those three. Let's spend money on them. And the model, the nice thing about a model is it keeps track of all of these things at one go. So this okay situation for the government, the debt to GDP ratio, is based upon or allows for all those increases in expenditures that bring down the poverty uh, index. And finally, well, again, I'm in an appropriate place to say this, I think when I look at what's happening and happened to education, we've put more and more emphasis on trying to educate people for the workforce, when I think the future lies in having more time to ourselves, we have to also be uh, educating ourselves for how to use that time more creatively. I just want to say a couple more words about the top one, new meanings and measures of success. I like this photo of Sarkozy, it's not very characteristic of him, but uh, he asked this question, how should we measure progress? And he went to these two, well you can't see their full name, Joseph Stiglitz and Amartya Sen, two very, very eminent economists, and asked them if they could help uh, answer this question. And they produced a report, see the subtitle, why the GDP doesn't add up, it's a really good overview more than that, it's a detailed account of all of the problems with GDP as a measure of progress, a measure of well-being, and it looks at alternative measures that different people have proposed. But I picked out from this report one quote which I think summarizes the work that I've described to you now about how we might have to live differently. They say, and this suggests that it's now entering the mainstream, it may not be possible to increase the production, especially of goods, beyond limit because of the environmental damage that this would entail. As society progresses, it is not unreasonable to expect people to enjoy some of the fruit of that progress in the form of leisure. So again, I mean, I think it's really significant that a, a now uh, ex-president would, would uh, call on these eminent people to look into this question. And it is having something of a ripple effect in statistical agencies around the world now who are trying to find better measures for progress. So I think, there are many challenges ahead. I see four that really attract my attention, which are in some ways the focus of my ongoing work. I haven't said anything about the financial sector because in the work I've just described to you, I really didn't look at the financial sector. I made some assumptions about how it was functioning. Those assumptions don't really stand the test of time. What we really need is a financial system that serves the real economy but doesn't dominate it. So where we get true benefits is from what we produce and consume. We need a financial system that makes that happen and makes that possible, doesn't overturn it and become, if you like, the main uh, activity of an economy as it seems to have done, in, at least in southern England. What about the real economy, though? We don't just need any real economy. We, want, we need one that serves the interests of people and communities. Um, and there are many things to say about that. The term throughput refers to that total quantity of materials and energy that pass through an economy. It's a term that Herman Daly uh, has popularized. We need absolute reductions in throughput, not just relative, not just more efficiency. We've got to bring down the pressure that we're putting on the biosphere to support our economies. <coughs> and we have to stem the loss of biodiversity. Uh, it's, 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 it's one of the tragedies of, of our times, I think. So I want to now just say a few words just to finish off to let you know what I'm currently doing to try to understand these problems a little bit better. So that's me and I wrote this book and I met this guy and he wrote this book and we realized we were the only two authors who'd put without growth in the titles of our book. So we met at this restaurant. <laughs> Nothing upmarket you can see um, and we decided we would build a new model. We called it Gemma and uh, I can't even remember what it stands for, but at the time it seemed like a good acronym. But it's all about a, um, an environmental model uh, which um, also includes the financial system. Let me explain why that, that's the case. 
I said I'm an ecological economist. Ecological economics has been very helpful in teaching economists about the importance of understanding the natural world. And so we have to worry about where the materials come from, where the wastes go, and what all those interactions are about. And I think that's been very valuable. There's a whole other group of economists, frankly a much larger group, who are now looking at this. What is the relationship between the financial system and the real economy? Um, the efforts to try to sort of firm up the financial system so the real economy can continue to grow. But in the course of doing that sort of inquiry, we learn a lot about this relationship. So what we're trying to do is construct a model which now has all three sectors um, pretty fully represented. And I have to tell you, it, it's not an easy task. It's the easy thing to agree with a friend over, a, over dinner in a restaurant, but when you finally get down to doing the work, it's very hard because we do our work with a lot of empirical data, not just writing out the equations, but we want to measure things by the data that's available. And the trouble is that these are three different worlds, and the statistics you can get from each often don't mesh. Uh, industries can be defined differently by people looking at what industries do to the natural environment than they are when they talk about how they interact with other industries. So it takes a lot of time to, to get the data into some sort of shape. My final comment to leave with you is this question of, well, okay, if there is a different path that we should be following, one that's not predicated on the pursuit of growth, can we actually adapt to that? What are the kind of changes that we need? Well, I could just try to say it, but I do think we as individuals are very adaptable. We are an amazing species from that respect. My problem comes here. It's our institutions that have to adapt. Yeah. And you can see, I'm sure you can recognize all of those, some national, international, religious, legal, financial, and so on, business. And these large institutions um, typically don't change very fast. They resist change. And I think this is a, this is a big problem. And if we fail, to make the adaptions that are required, I think the future looks really bleak. We're heading into some very heavy storm clouds. However, I remain optimistic. I hope that I've shown you that I do think there are alternative futures out there that we can build for ourselves. So this isn't the image I'm going to leave you with. I'm going to leave you with this one. <laughs> I do think that there is a bright future out there, but we've got to work for it. Thank you very much. <laughs>